Hey, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining me another uh, for another time of Bible teaching. Um, we're going to be looking at 2 Thessalonians 2. Um, and a lot of topics that we're going to cover, the man of lawlessness, who's the restrainer, um, what day are they even talking about, what's the context of this, why is even Paul writing this letter? Um, and, you know, does this tell us that the rapture is pre-trib? Does it tell us it's not pre-trib? Because I recently had somebody just on one of my teachings just quote, um, Second Thessalonians 2, verse 1 and 3. I'm not sure why they skipped 2. But as if they're saying, making a statement that the rapture is not pre-trib. They didn't say that. I know what they're thinking. I can actually look back and see some of the other stuff they posted. So I got an idea of where their mindset is, but I've seen this before. So let's take a look at it and let's dig in. So we're going to um, first read through this passage of scripture. Because you got to context. Context is everything. You can't just take one verse and say it means this. You got to look at the whole context. And you have to look at it with other prophecy. Because it all has to fit together. It's really easy to try to lie with scripture and say that something means something when it doesn't fit with everything else. But you're only looking at the one piece. Uh, reminds me of like Lincoln Logs. You know, anybody played Lincoln Logs a long time ago? If you have one piece and you try to tell me it's a beautiful building, I'm going to have trouble believing you. You can't do a lot with one, one block. You have to have them all fitting together. And scripture is kind of the same way. All right. You could use Legos as well for the younger folks out there. All right. So anyhow, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles. And let me slide this over. And I'm going to go ahead and read. And we'll go, and then we'll get into this. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of the Christ, the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or wor that is worshipped. And he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember when I was still with you and I told you these things? I told you so. And now you know. What is restraining him, or what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, and he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy and the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is in accordance with the workings of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and all unrighteous deception among those who perish. But they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved with the love of the truth that saves. And for this reason, because they didn't receive the love of the truth, God will send them a strong delusion. Oh, we got to look at what that strong delusion might be. That they might believe the lie. And they, and they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So the truth and unrighteousness are kind of opposites. And it's important. That truth is important because people are going to be condemned and perish because of the not understanding what truth is. All right. So, the first thing is, you can't take one of these verses out and say it means something without looking at everything, all right? But what caused this? What, why did Paul feel compelled to write this? And I, I wish Paul would have written things in his passages, such as, um, I'm writing this letter because somebody told me that the, he did. He doesn't. 
I don't think Paul knew that when he's sitting around writing a bunch of letters that, you know, here we are, you know, almost 2,000 years later that we're going to be studying his, his letters as scripture. I don't think he knew that. But um, so let's dig in and see what he says in here that would tell us what it might be. Um, starting again in verse one. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's rapture right there, that we're gathered together to him. At least that's how I see it. Somebody else may see it differently. That's OK. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, so we'll stop here and break this down. So I believe that that is the rapture that it's speaking of. But the question is, what is that day? Oh, first of all, um, when you see anybody, I, I don't know if I mentioned this. I tried did, did another take earlier, and I didn't like something I said, so I redid it. Anyhow, if so, I'm, if I said this before in this video recording, I apologize. Um, let no one deceive you by any means. If you see Paul any of the apostles, any of the New Testament writers write that. Let no one deceive you by any means. What's he telling you? Somebody's going to try to deceive you. Keep in mind that when it comes to eschatology, you know, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, all that, do you know what the most popular viewpoint is? Um, you're not going to, you may believe it, you may not believe it. It's the preterist viewpoint that everything was happening in 70, 70 AD. Of course, they're not going to be out there looking at stuff because it already happened. Why bother looking? It's history. Um, why is it that that's the most popular? That's the Catholic viewpoint. Anyhow, so you got to be careful. Somebody's going to try to uh, deceive us in here. So we want to be, he's warning us about that deception. All right. All right. So the day of the Lord. Hmm, what is that day? That day is a thousand years. Um, Psalm 90, verse 4, um, the Second Peter 3. Let's go to Second Peter 3. I know we do this all the time. Second hmm. Peter 3. Let's see. But beloved, do not forget this one thing. In other words, people are going to forget it. Don't forget this. It's like the wife sends you the grocery stores and don't forget that one thing. Isn't that the thing you always forget? Yeah. With the Lord, one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. You go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, probably the most misunderstood um, chapter about prophecy in the Bible. Uh, but about, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my father. What day is he talking about? We'll read the verse before it. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day, so is the is that day the end of the thousand years? Does all this stuff not happen till the end of the thousand years? That Satan who is going to be sitting, or the Antichrist who's going to sit in the throne of God as if he is God, is not going to happen until after the thousand years? That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's a thousand year period. And it's set, but the heaven and earth do take part place in that. So does the rapture, so does tribulation, so does all the millennial kingdom. Guess what? It all fits in that thousand years that Peter told us not to forget, to remember, to not put it aside, because it's important. That's why Peter was saying it's important to know that. People still don't get it. Um, the hour, the day and hour. You notice everybody skips over the hour here. 
I'm just go to Revelation 3, 10. I was just commenting on somebody's Facebook post today. A dear sister in Christ um, with regard to this, because somebody, they posted something where somebody said that the time of tribulation um, or that hour is the second half of tribulation. No. Because they have you because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. So that hour is tribulation. It's about testing those who dwell on the earth, those that are here after the rapture. What does he mean testing? There's going to be 21 judgments. The purpose of judgment is to bring about repentance. And you will see, I'm getting a little off task, but that's okay. If I look up, pull up, just pull up the word repent. Oh, I just spelled it wrong, didn't I? When you look in the book of Revelation, they blaspheme God because of the pains in their sores, and they did not repent of the deed. So after this horrendous thing, they, you know, plague, test, trial, judgment, they did not repent. Um uh, uh, where is it? You know, here's another one. Again, they did not repent of their sorceries. There's one that I really, uh, this is the one that blows my mind the most. But the rest of mankind were, who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass stone, who would neither see nor talk nor hear. Um, and, and one of these, it even says that they're shaking their fists at God. Really? Not smart. So, and again, it's a test. He wants you to pass the test. We know, based on the ministry of the um, 144,000, that many, multitudes and multitudes are going to come out of the Great Tribulation. They're going to be saved out of Tribulation. And their work starts at the beginning of Tribulation. Let's go back to Second Thessalonians 2. So that day is a thousand years. And we'll see how this fits, because we're going to see several different things occurring. And a lot of people will make the argument that it is just one day. Um, and I think they generally will say that it's like Armageddon at the end, because they're opposed to rivers. All right. So we're talking about the rapture when everybody's gathered to Messiah. Um, so you don't want to be shaken as if he's already come. Hasn't happened. Let no one deceive you. People are going to try to deceive you. That that day, starting with the rapture and tribulation, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the son of the man of sin is revealed. The son of perdition, the son of Satan. Who is that? That's the Antichrist. Where is he revealed? Go to Revelation um, 4, 5, 6. The first seal. Now I saw a lamb open one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with a voice like thunder, saying, come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. Doesn't Messiah come on a white horse? Messiah certainly does come on a white horse. And he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out to conquer and to conquer. Went out conquering and to conquer. What does Messiah have when he comes back? He's got a sword that comes out of his mouth. And he doesn't come back until the end of tribulation. This is the first seal. This is the beginning. This is somebody who looks at like Messiah, but he has a bow. Notice there's no arrows. He's not the one doing the dirty work at first. He will be coordinating and like sort of, this is my opinion, it's not in scripture, but there are no weapons here. They're just a bow. And it gets into like the um, iron and clay that are mixed together. It's confederacy and it's treaties, diplomatic things and all that. But anyhow, that's beside the point. We see that the Antichrist comes back the very beginning of tribulation at the first seal judgment. So with that information, Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians 2.
Yep, that went too far. Let no one deceive you. That day will not come until the Antichrist, the man of sin, is revealed. Notice a man of sin. What's the definition of sin? To miss the mark. What's the mark? <laughs> we'll talk about that in a second. Um, let's first look at a word here. The falling away. Um, it's it's called, I believe in some editions it's called, or some places called the rebellion. I want to take a look at that and see exactly what is that. Because it's going to tie into everything else. Okay, we come down here. Will not come except one that the falling away. So this is the other part of what has to happen first. To forsake a falling away. Falling away, defection, apostasy. Um, it only shows up in two places. Um, could go through apostasies, but I'm not. We're not going to do. Oh, here we go. I think that one is apostasy. You know what, let's go back, because I do want to go here, but I need to show you something first. Give me one second. Okay, see this right here, it says this, that this word that we're looking at is the feminine of the same as this. So it's the same word, but it's a feminine of it. It's a defection from truth. That's going to be very important in this conversation, truth. And we're going to get into the question, what is truth? Guess what? People say, you can have your truth, I'll have my truth. There is one truth, and that's Messiah's truth. Okay, a divorce. Oh, our relationship with Messiah is a wedding. You don't want a divorce. No, 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 no. Bill of divorce, repudiation. Oh, being put away. That's not, none of this is good. Let's go a little further. But it could be good. Huh. Let's, let's go a little further. Um, where's the word I want to get to? Give me a minute. So this is a falling away from truth. We've seen now this has something to do with divorce which would be a falling away from truth because Messiah is truth. But this word has a derivative, and we're going to go into this word. So being that this is the same as the, the other word we're looking at straight from Scripture, this is the derivative of that word as well. And it talks about to make standoff, to cause, to withdraw, to remove. This could be the rapture. I'm not saying it definitely has to be. To depart from anyone, to stand alone. Uh, to fall away, which we're which we're seeing, um, to flee from, to I like to withdraw from oneself, to fall away. Um, it could be, but I would lean more towards just the falling away from truth. Uh, and I've heard it debated that this is the rapture here. But guess what? It's going to give us a little more clarification as to what this is as we go further down. So this truth thing is important, and we will get to that. Let's keep reading. So the Son of Man is revealed, the Son of Perdition. That's the beginning of tribulation. So this falling away, whatever it is, has to happen before that. And here's what he does. He opposes himself and exalts himself above all that is called God. That is worship so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the midpoint of tribulation. So this day has come before the Antichrist has been revealed in um, Revelation 6.1, and before the midpoint of tribulation, where he's going to sit on the temple. We see this in Daniel 9.27. Um, he confirms the covenant with many in the midst of it. There'll be an abomination of desolation at the temple. We can find it in other places as well. Do you not remember I told you these things? You knew this. And now you know. What is restaining that he may be revealed in his own time? But what is restraining? For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. 
Only he who restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Forever and ever, I believe that this was the Holy Spirit that's going to get taken out of the way. Guess what? The Holy Spirit cannot be removed. Why not? Hmm. Go to, look at those, let's go look at those 144,000 in Revelation 7. And they are sealed. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. How do you get sealed? What does that mean? Um, go to Ephesians 1, 13. Oh, I'm sorry, give me a second here. Ephesians 1, verse 13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Oh, the truth again. The gospel of your salvation. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Do we find that somewhere else? Go to Ephesians 4.30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You were sealed for that day of redemption. Hmm. So if the Holy Spirit is how someone's sealed, and these 144,000 witnesses are sealed, guess what? The Holy Spirit is here during tribulation. And that makes sense, because God is everywhere, and the Holy Spirit is part of God, because in um, Deuteronomy 6, we know that the Lord our God, plural word, is one. Three are one. In the beginning, God created Elohim, plural word. Anyhow, so let's go back to 2 Thessalonians 2. I would tell you that I'm going to try to wrap this up soon, but you know what? I'm not. And you, you can look and see how much time's left, and I, I don't know because I'm still talking. All right. Um, so let's keep let's keep going down here. This lawless one. We need to look at the truth and the lawless one, and the workings of lawlessness and this unright and this unrighteousness down here. All right. Um, so the coming of the lawless one is according to the workings of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception. So he's a deceiver among those who perish. People are going to be perishing because they did not receive the love of the truth. Did we skip something up here? I think we did. Yeah. The restrainer, who is it? If it's not the Holy Spirit, guess what? It's the church. If the church is here, if the people who actually, and not everybody who attends a church, walking into a church makes you a Christian as much as walking into a garage somewhere makes you a mechanic those who belong to him. If he showed up, there would, there would be so many people on this earth saying, oh my goodness, that's him. That's him. Look, there's that scripture. Here's that scripture. Yeah, the church is what's restraining him. He's not coming until his time. We get raptured first. Then he's revealed. All right. The coming of the lawless one is according to works of saints with all power, signs, and lying wonders. What are these powers, signs, and lying wonders? Okay. And we can see that they are going to deceive people. And all with all with unrighteous, not righteous, unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not love the truth. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at righteousness, unrighteousness, lawlessness, but first, these lying wonders. What are these lying wonders? And I'll tell you what, it's also this thing right here. For, and for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion. Why is God sending them a strong delusion? That they should believe a lie. God wants them to believe a lie? No, it's their choice. It's their choice. And you'll see that in a minute. It's a test. And throughout tribulation, it is all about a test. Whether or not you love the Lord. For they will, and that they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure 
in unrighteousness. And oh my goodness, I could go so many places here. So let's let's get into this. Um, let's start with Revelation 12. Give me a second. Yeah, Revelation 13, 13. These strong delusions, these tests, these things that they are going to deceive people. This is the false prophet. And he ex exercises all the authority of the first beast, the Antichrist. And at this point, we're midway through tribulation. The Antichrist is indwelled by Satan himself. Um, but the false prophet, um, we know that. I saw another beast coming up out of the sea with two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all the authority. And it's gonna, so he's going to look like a religious figure of some sort, maybe a pope. That's my thought. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell on it to worship the first beast. So in other words, you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping Satan, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven onto the earth. Can't do that without God. You'll see, we see elsewhere that, um, that they, he can't. Everything God has given him authority over the saints for times, times, and half a times. Anyhow, and he deceives those. That's the deception that we're that we're listening to, who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Yeah, it's permission to do it. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword. And live. In other words, telling them to do something that is not of God. Where do we see this? That we know what was what this is. That you know, we knew beforehand. We knew before John even wrote this that it could possibly happen. It's Deuteronomy thirteen. And then Moses went and spoke these words to all of Israel, and he said to them, "I am." Yep, thirteen. Deuteronomy 13, starting in verse 1. If there arises among you a prophet, like a false prophet, or a dreamer of dreams who gives you a sign or a wonder, like calling down fire from heaven, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke, who you sang, let us go after other gods. Yeah, let's make images. Let's make um, pagan idols, images, blasphemy th blasphemous things which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you. Hmm, tribulation's a test, a test all of those who live on the earth. Notice it's not all the Jews, it's all of those who live on the earth. Who know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Is that Torah? Well, yeah, we're in Torah. We're in Deuteronomy. His commandments, he's talking about Torah, the instructions of God. So let's go back to, this is confusing. It's really not. It's really not. Um, let's look at the truth. We need to get the truth, right? What is the truth? Let's start with the easy one for the truth, Messiah, John. John 14. Sorry about that. John 4, I'm just trying to figure out in my head where I want to go with this. John 14, 6. For Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There we have it. There's truth, Messiah. But there's more. Go to 1 John, same writer. 1 John, um, I'm sorry, 5, 6. And he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but also by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. So you have Messiah and the Spirit as truth. So in other words, if somebody says, the Holy Spirit told me, and Messiah said something different, 
somebody's wrong there because if the messiah is fear is truth and if the spirit is truth they cannot contradict one another while we're here let's get a definition of sin since we're in this part of john and understand this is the same writer Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. What is lawlessness? Right here, this anemia. It's the condition of being without Torah, without sin, without God's instructions, because of, of ignorant of it, because of violating it, contempt and violation of the law, iniquity and wickedness. Does anybody in the world, do they have like contempt towards the... Uh, Torah towards God's instructions. Oh, yeah. Truth, this thing that people are going to fall away from, and it's going to cost them dearly. What else could it be? Um, go to Psalms. Do we trust David? Yep. Either, by the way, if you don't like this definition for the, for the, um, this definition of sin, that John gave us, that sin is lawlessness, um, and you don't believe that, and you think that's wrong, and you want to look at something a different way, then John is a false prophet, and you can't believe anything he writes. That's John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and all of the book of Revelation. Let's now go to um, the book of Psalms, 119. And verse 160. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. See, the judgments are what happens if you don't follow Torah, or what happens if you don't follow the instructions of God. And they are righteous because they are right standing because God told you ahead of time, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And if it's executed, the thing about righteousness here is that it's not the person who carries out the judgment that is guilty. It's the one who did it. And that's where the blame goes. But anyhow, the entirety of your word is truth. This is Psalms. This is every word of scripture is truth. <clears throat> Let's, can we get more specific as to which words? We sure can. Let's go back to 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Paul gives us a clue. If we look at lawlessness, that's the condition of being without Torah. And we're going to put all this together in a minute. And he gives us an opposite here. Right here. Do not be unequally yoked with with together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light and darkness? Light and darkness are opposites. Righteousness and lawlessness are opposites. If I pulled up this and we looked at this in context, he's going to give you a list of things that are opposites. So we want to be righteous. Hmm, interesting. Let's go one other place, and then I'm going to bring this back. And we'll go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, then I'm just going to go one other place and finish this up. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2. So Paul's saying, do not be, do not be um, deceived, because people are going to try to deceive you, that in order for the rapture has to happen first, but there's going to be falling away from the truth. Oh my goodness, that's been going on for a long time. Um but also that Satan can't even be, re or the Antichrist cannot be revealed until this, the one who's restraining him is removed. That is the church. That is not necessarily the church. That is those who belong to Messiah that get removed first. We see it throughout scripture. We just read the passage about the hour. Okay. Um, and that day is a thousand years. And when the lawless one, that's the person that's not following God's ways, who's against Torah, against God's instructions, is revealed, then the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. When does the lawless one get destroyed? We have to look at this, because this goes into a lot. 
too. Okay, he's going to be revealed. He's going to sit in the throne of God, and then he's going to get destroyed. Okay, go to Revelation 19. <laughs> we went 17 through 21. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and all the people free and slave, great and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together, Armageddon, okay? Um, one thing real quick, many years ago, people would say, not many years ago, I guess that's all, um, relative as to how long many years is, but 20, 30, 40 years ago, people said, oh, this isn't possible. There's no way. There are no carnivorous birds in Israel. Guess what? Carnivorous birds have been flocking to Israel by the tens and hundreds of thousands. They're everywhere over there now. Interesting. This is now possible. Uh, it's just a, tells you the sign of where we're at. Um, anyhow, then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in the pres in his presence, by which he deceived. Again, there's a, that deception. All who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped the angel, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword that pro proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and the birds were filled with their flesh. The rest of them do not go back in. It's when the thousand years, and you have the great, the thousand years are over, then you have the great white throne judgment, and then the rest of those who were killed were brought back to life. And they're going to get thrown into the lake of fire at that point. So the Antichrist and the false prophet are the first fruits of the resurrection of death. So if Satan gets thrown, or the Antichrist gets thrown into the lake of fire at the end of tribulation after Armageddon, how can it be this tell you it's a post-tribulation rapture? It can't. It really can't. All right. Um, they took joy. Go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, the last point I want to draw out here. You know, I think this is very important. Understanding lawlessness, I believe you can see that this is the, the truth, which includes every word of scripture, which includes Torah is the make or break. Okay, where you're not saved by the law, you're saved by grace and by faith and what Messiah did on a cross. But then you walk in faith. That's the evidence of your faith. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. John 14, 15. A lot of people like got saved, they, they got baptized, and they thumb their nose at God, and they don't want to obey his commands. Why did That's why Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Who wrote Torah? Messiah did. Sorry, I'm getting a little carried away, but yes, I do get emotional about this. Um, on second thought, brothers and sisters, let's go to 2 Peter 3. You know, I don't always know 100% where my videos are going to take me. I make some rough notes. Um, I don't want to script every little thing out because that would be of me. This gives the Holy Spirit possibly some time to uh, intercede and tell me what he wants, where it wants you to go. So we're looking at lawlessness. We're looking at sin. We're looking at um, God's instructions. And I want to go to a verse that you guys are really familiar with and give you some insight to what Peter is actually talking about. So let's go to 2 Peter 2, 3. And we'll start in verse 1. Beloved, I write to you now, I write to you the second epistle in which I stir up your pure minds, but by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words that were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandment of us the apostles, the Lord, our Savior, knowing first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust. That's not good, is it? And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue, and they were 
from the beginning of creation. Were they willing? Okay, you can go down and down and down. So we we people look at oh yeah, those scoffers can you know are coming are going to come point to their own lust. If you go down in the conclusion of this, and this is like one of the last things Paul's writing. I want to look at his conclusion. Therefore, in other words, after what he's written, this is the conclusion he's drawing. All of this other stuff. Therefore, if you ever see therefore. You got to stop and say, what's it there for? He's drawing a conclusion. Beloved, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, the coming of Messiah, being diligent to be found in by him in peace, without spot and blameless. In other words, without sin. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Also, our brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, and he's going to talk about how. The, the writings of Paul's can be hard to understand, and people will, will, um, how does he word it here? Which untaught, unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do the rest of the scripture. So he's saying that Paul's teachings are very hard to understand at times. Therefore, beloved, since you knew this beforehand, beware lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of wicked, wickedness, or error of the wicked, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. So at the very end of this, he's saying you can, you know, grow in our save the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, or get led away into the error of the wicked. What is the wicked? Um, of course, everybody's got ideas that come up as to what wicked means, but let's see what the word here is, the biblical word here. Here we go, wicked. One who breaks three, breaks through the restraints of the law and gratify his own lusts. That goes right up to who the scoffers are one who breaks through the restraints of the law and gratifies his own lust. The law, God's instructions, he gives it to you sort of like guardrails to keep you on the right track. You don't want to break through those. To keep who gratifies his own lusts. What do you say at the beginning? Huh? What do you say that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts? I hope that makes sense to you. Anyhow, if you stay with me this long, God bless you. Thank you. You guys have a great day. Take care.